There's no denying that China has one of the richest histories of any country in the world, but as economy booms, there's a constant tug of war between the old and new. And nowhere is this culture clash more pronounced than in Datong, a historic frontier city in the north of China that is not only home to some of China's most important historical Buddhist sites, a rich food culture and friendly locals, but also has the unfortunate nickname of the Coal City and an old town with a complicated restoration legacy. When I messaged my friend to tell him I was coming, he described it as the ugliest city in China, although he did visit way back in 2014. And from what I hear, a lot has changed since then. But before we get to the present day, we have to go a long way back to properly understand Dat Hong's journey. Our first stop is the Yungang Grottoes, a series of caves containing over 51,000 carved statues of Buddha, some large, some small, and all very impressive. Datong is a bit of an overlooked city, but around 1500 years ago when the Northern Wei Dynasty ruled these parts, it made it its capital. After adopting Buddhism as its state religion, it began carving these epic shrines into the rock. Often I find myself a little underwhelmed by historical sites, but the Yungang Grottoes filled me with a sense of wonder and were anything but disappointing. But what would I make of Datong itself, an industrial city that has pretty mixed reviews? Well, I skipped the coal mines that surrounded the city and headed straight for the historic center. The so-called Old Town couldn't be any more different from the hustle and bustle of central Beijing. A huge wall surrounds a few quiet streets that are dotted with a mixture of tourist attractions and half-finished building sites. We headed straight for the city wall to gain a better view of the city. If you look beyond the wall, then Datong is pretty much the same as any other industrial city in China. Except it isn't. The apartment blocks you can see off in the distance are filled with people that used to live in the old town. A couple of decades ago, in an effort to boost tourism and push the economy away from a reliance on coal, the mayor decided to restore the old town to its former glory, which basically meant bulldozing the simple houses that stood there and completely rebuilding the city from scratch. This was a controversial project and one that attracted international media attention and went way over budget. But if there's one thing that I've learned whilst living in China, it's that even though Chinese cities are constantly evolving, there's one thing that stays the same, the food. And if you want to know what really gets the locals fired up, it's their cuisine. Shanxi cuisine is known for its love of noodles and love of vinegar. And here in Datong, it is no different. We've ordered a selection of local dishes and I'm excited to try. Okay, so I'm gonna try one of these meatballs, but they don't look like they've got any meat in them. Ooh. It's a strange texture. It's kind of like jelly. Oh, noodles seem really popular here, especially in Datong. I've seen three different types on the menu. So we got a chopped type, which we've had with like a spicy sauce, which are really good. And these have 
leeks and carrots inside. Well, I made a bit of a mess of that. I'm assuming you dip it in here. Um, it doesn't really have very much flavor. With our stomachs bursting, we headed back to the hotel to rest up for another day of activities. Whilst much of the old town has been chopped and changed in recent years, there are still a few historical sites of interest dotted around the city. Most notably, our first stop of the day. I'm here at the Huayan Temple, which dates back a thousand years to the Liao Dynasty. Even if you're not religious, this place is amazing. You come just for the architecture. Apparently, there's also a library here that has over 18,000 Buddhist volumes. The thing about temples here in China is more often than not, they're in the city centre. So they're often surrounded by shops and tourist attractions. But once you get inside, it's like an oasis of peace and quiet. There is no doubting that Buddhism is one of the many pieces of the complicated jigsaw that make up what China is today. And our next stop combines the most ancient of Buddhist traditions with another great Chinese passion, engineering. This is the Hanging Monastery, a temple built into the side of a cliff that hangs precariously 50 meters above the ground. It's pretty impressive, like first impression. It looks like a little model, and obviously we're gonna be up on there soon. That's because we're quite far away, but it's a pretty cool. I've never seen anything like this before. this place is a little bit scary. It was built over 1400 years ago by drilling holes into the mountainside, then the poles were put into the holes and the temples built on top of the poles, like on stilts, which is a little bit weird. Also, if legend has it, it was built by just one man. I'm not sure if I believe this story or not, but why let the truth get in the way of a good tale? One thing I can tell you for certain is that although this temple is Buddhist in origin, it is the only one in the world where Confucianism and Taoism are also practiced. The Chinese people certainly have a knack for impressive architectural feats. And although some of them may be controversial at the time, later generations will certainly appreciate the vision of their ancestors. I'm not sure if it was the height or the temple itself, but it certainly took my breath away. I'm glad to have my feet firmly back on the ground though. Now I've got a five hour journey back to Beijing, but before I hop on the bus, let me say if you enjoyed this, check out my Patreon for some more content from this place. Make sure you subscribe to my channel and leave me a comment letting me know where you would like to see me go next. I'll see you next time.